Thanks, Matt, for the kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be here and share some of my work with you guys. So the topic that I'm going to be speaking on today is rethinking hospital rankings. And it's something that is very relevant to all of us as physician providers, as well as uh, healthcare administrators and health systems. And the focus is going to be on how can we move from a policy-based evidence approach that has been in the practice for most of our uh, times towards an evidence-based policy approach. So let's start with uh, something that we all are familiar with. You can always look up a hospital on Medicare Hospital Compare website to see how a particular hospital is ranked in terms of its performance for patient care as compared to other hospitals. So let's start with the hospital A, which has a 8.6% heart failure mortality rate in 30 days and a 21.5% heart failure readmission rate in 30 days. And hospital B that has a slightly higher mortality rate of 10.5%, so 2% higher heart failure mortality rate for 30 days and a lower 1% lower heart failure readmission rate. Hospital one is the hospital that I work at. It's the Parkland Hospital, which is a county hospital providing care to the underserved population of Dallas. Hospital B is a private medical uh, center, and these data come from the Hospital Compare website. So if you compare the two hospitals, Parkland versus Baylor, you see a higher readmission rate among heart failure patients treated at Parkland, but a substantially lower mortality rate. So how do you define which hospital is better? And my hope is that the talk today will give us more insights into how do we look at these performance metrics and when we are thinking of hospital performance for specific conditions. So the first question that comes to mind when we are thinking of hospital care quality is what indeed is care quality and how do we incentivize better quality of care? So the Institute of Medicine defines healthcare quality as the degree to which healthcare services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with our current professional knowledge, which are uh, evidenced in the literature and in guidelines. And there have been a lot of work done in understanding quality and defining quality metrics. The first step to understanding quality is to be able to measure it. And quality metrics are the key uh, resources that we employ to measure quality of care. And the Donabalian model of healthcare quality is currently the paradigm that is being used, and it defines quality metrics into three bins. There are structural quality metrics, there are process of care quality metrics, and then there are outcome-based quality metrics. So let's start with the structural measures of quality or structural quality metrics. And the most commonly used structure-based performance or quality uh, metric is hospital volume. So there's a lot of data coming from procedural literature that have shown that hospitals that perform higher volume of procedures tend to have better outcomes. And the data that is shown on the slide here comes from the TAVR literature, where on x-axis you have annualized hospital procedural volume for TAVRs, and on y-axis you have 30-day mortality. And as you can see in this uh, plot here, as we go from left to right on the x-axis with increasing annualized hospital procedure volume, there is a downward slope with a decrease in 30-day mortality rate, suggesting that hospitals that have high volume of procedures tended to have better 30-day mortality outcomes. Similar relationship has been reported between operator level volumes as well. And the graph on your right shows the relationship between operator and hospital volumes and outcomes following PCI in the era of coronary stenting, and you again have a PCI volume by ear on the x-axis and complication rate on the y-axis. And you see the same downward slope uh, as we go from left to right, suggesting that as we have more hospital Medicare PCI volume per year, we have less fewer complications post-PCI, at least uh, in this Medicare population. So overall, uh, it is a pretty accepted paradigm that higher volume is associated with better care and quality, particularly when it comes to procedural outcomes and also for other disease-based outcomes like acute myocardial infarction volume and heart failure volume. How about process of care metrics? So process of care metrics are basically focused on things that are guideline recommended that we should be doing for patients when they are hospitalized with acute cardiovascular conditions. For example, the ACC-AHA performance measures 
for heart failure care include left ventricular ejection fraction assessment during hospitalization, initiation on evidence-based guideline-directed medical therapy, providing ICD counseling, door to balloon time for STEMI is a very uh, well-accepted measure of process of care. And for a long time, hospitals were incentivized uh, with, a, with a financial incentives if they met these process of care metrics. But if you look at the, the vast amount of literature evaluating the association of process-based performance metrics with clinical outcomes, usually the outcome associations have been rather weak. So this brings us to the outcome-based performance metric, which basically cuts out the middleman of structure or process metrics and just focuses on how the patients do during their course of care and post-discharge to assess hospital care quality. And this is currently the most accepted and utilized form of performance metric by Medicare and other payers. And the most common example that you all must have heard of is 30-day readmission rate and 30-day mortality rate. So hospitals taking care of patients with MI or heart failure, they are uh, accounted, uh, are held accountable for how these patients do post-discharge by looking at the 30-day readmission rate and 30-day mortality rate. And the distribution plots here show there's a wide variation in these risk standardized measures of outcome-based performance metrics such that hospital can have high versus low readmission and mortality rate. And hospitals that have high rates of these uh, adverse outcomes are considered to be providing poor care or uh, worse quality of care. And hospital readmission reduction program is a great example of the current policy that is driven by outcome-based performance metrics, which incentivizes hospitals to reduce readmission burden by providing them greater uh, financial incentives for maintaining lower uh, risk-adjusted readmission rates. So under this program, the hospital readmission-based performance is linked to the payment and as much as 3% of the Medicare payments can be held back for having a readmission performance that is worse than the expected uh, readmission rate. And this has been in, uh, in practice, or this has been implemented since 2012, and there have been some far-reaching implications of this metric and this policy. So what have we accomplished with implementation of hospital readmission reduction program. So the graph here shows the rates of 30-day all-cause readmission rate over time. So we have the readmission rates on the y-axis and we have time in years plotted on the x-axis. The blue line represents the readmission trajectory in the pre-hospital readmission reduction program era. And the red line demonstrates the readmission rate trajectory in the post-hospital readmission reduction program era. And as you can see, there was a modest trend towards the reduction in readmission rates in the pre-HARP era, but as soon as and after an implementation of the readmission reduction policy, there has been a sharp decline in readmission rates across all conditions over the, even shortly after implementation of this program, as evidenced by the significant negative slope of the red line shown here. And, if you look at the trends in average penalty that have been incurred on hospitals for having higher than expected readmission, you see there has been a significant increase in the average penalty that a hospital has been imposed for maintaining higher than expected readmission rate. So on this, in this plot, again, we have time on the x-axis from 2013 to 2017. 2013 was the first year of readmission penalty. And on y-axis, we have the average penalty which is the proportion of the Medicare payments that was withheld for having higher than expected readmission. And as you can see, up to a thousand hospitals had high penalties in 2013 and their penalty amount continued to increase. And even for hospitals that had low penalty initially, they also have had a significant increase in their average penalty. So hospitals are losing money for having a higher than expected readmission rates. And this penalty amount has increased over time. And if you look at 30-day readmission rates, so the outcome of interest that was targeted with this policy stratified by the amount of penalty that was in incurred by hospitals, we see that hospitals that had higher penalty amounts had more decline in the readmission rate. So the penalty did its job. Individual uh, Hospitals that got more penalty were more incentivized to reduce their readmission rate, and this is what we saw. So the panel A shows the pen, uh, readmission trajectory 
in hospitals that had no penalty in the first year, and there was no change in the readmission rate. And as we go from panel A to panel D, we are showing hospitals with increasing amount of the penalty, and you will see that the readmission slope starts to get more and more negative, highlighting greater reduction in the readmission rate, such that the hospitals that receive the highest penalty, which is more than 1% or up to 1% in the first year of the readmission reduction era, there was a significant decrease in the downstream readmission rates, suggesting that the penalties did what they were supposed to do and in a graded dose-dependent fashion. And if you look at the overall uh, impact of penalties, the number of hostels that have been penalized has increased over time. And in 2018, up to 2,573 hospitals received penalties for having higher than expected readmission rate. And in 2020, the total amount of penalty was $563 million. And it was an average penalty amount of 0.7% of their readmission uh, of their total Medicare uh, expenditure. So now we have seen that performance in the readmission metric was improved by targeting this metric with a financial penalty. But what really matters to us is, has the patient care actually improved and hospitals that are getting this financial incentive, are they doing a better job at taking care of the patients beyond just improving the number, which is the readmission rate? So let's take a closer look at that. And this work done by our group looked at the association of 30-day readmission metric under the hospital admission reduction program with the measures of quality of care and outcomes among patients with heart failure. In this study, we looked at the first year of readmission penalty in which uh, year we had around 49% of the get with the guidelines heart failure participating centers penalized for having higher than expected readmission rate. And if you look at this bar plot here, we did not observe any significant difference in adherence to guideline recommended care, which includes an initiation on guideline directed medical therapies, providing appropriate discharge instructions, and uh, providing ICD counseling. There was no difference in adherence to these measures of patient care among hospitals that had higher versus lower than expected readmission rate. And we have the hospitals that performed well on this metric in this dark uh, gray uh, bar plot and the hustles that had higher readmission rate than expected and got penalized are in the lighter shade uh, plot. And also we did not see a difference in the one year readmission and death outcomes among centers that were versus were not penalized under this program. So even though the 30 day readmission burden was lower in the penalized cent uh, centers, the one year outcomes came back to all uh, no different from the centers that were not penalized, suggesting that the effect on readmission was rather short lasting. And after 30 days, there was not a meaningful difference in the patient outcomes among hospitals that did uh, better versus worse on this metric. The outcomes have also been looked for mortality. And the study here was one of the seminal studies that was led by my friend Ankur Gupta from Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Registry, looking at the association of uh, hospital readmission reduction program implementation with readmission and mortality outcomes in heart failure. So on this plot, we have time shown on the x-axis for years, and then we have 30-day mortality rate shown on the y-axis, and the temporal trajectory has been split into three time epochs, which is basically the pre-implementation -impl pre uh, era of uh, hospital readmission reduction program, during the implementation, and then post-implementation. And as you can see here, in the pre-implementation era from 2006 to 2010, there was a decline in heart failure mortality rate at 30 day, largely due to improving care of these patients. But this decline or improvement in heart failure mortality was kind of lost and there was a slight uptrend in mortality rates during the time of implementation of the readmission reduction program. And there was a substantial increase in the heart failure mortality in the 30 day period in the post-implementation era highlighting that while we made some gains in reducing the readmission, we paid a price to that by an increase in heart failure mortality during the uh, post implementation of the readmission reduction penalties. And as you all know, patients who die don't really get ad readmitted. So it was in many ways, the price that we paid for focusing too much on a readmission outcome that actually does not account for the mortality in these patients. <clears throat> 
And we, our group has also looked at this and looked at a more longitudinal trajectory-based analysis where we stratified the hospitals uh, that participate in the Medicare uh, hospital admission reduction program into strata based on their 30-day risk standardized readmission rate trajectories. So in the graph on your left, the group one shown in the blue line is the best performer group that had most reduction in readmission between 2010 to 2016. The group in the red is the worst performer based on the readmission uh, metric that had highest readmission rates in this time period. And if you look at the mortality rates in these hospitals, which is shown on the y-axis in the graph on your left, the best performing group based on the readmission metric had the higher, highest mortality rate and an uptrend in the mortality over time. And the worst performing group actually had better mortality, so lower mortality rates, and had less increase in mortality over time, suggesting that focusing too much on the readmission actually may not be the best way forward where we are missing the signal of higher mortality in hospitals that were able to maintain lower readmission rate. On the right graph, we have flipped this where we stratified the hospitals based on their mortality trajectories and looked at readmission. And you see a more concordant performance such that hospitals that are best performing based on the mortality metric were also best performing for a readmission reduction, a readmission rates as shown by the the steep decline in readmission in group one, which is the best performer for mortality, and same for group four. Then let's look at how the hospital, uh, how the readmission and mortality trends in US compare to those in Canada, our neighboring country. So in the time period between 2008 to 2015, we have had a significant reduction in readmission and of increase in mortality as evidenced by the data that I presented earlier and shown in this graph on the left. And someone may argue that this may have been because we are taking care of sicker patients, disease epidemiology has evolved and it is not necessarily the care we provide but the evolution in disease epidemiology. But if that were the case, you would expect a similar increase in mortality in Canada among patients with heart failure, which has a very different healthcare model, but not too different heart failure uh, disease epidemiology. But if you look at the trends in heart failure readmission mortality in Canada, shown in the graph on uh, your right, readmission has declined similar to what we see in US and mortality has also declined and not increased compared to what you see in the US population. So in 2015, the heart failure mortality at 30 days in US was 9.2 and in Canada was 6.6. .6. So they have done a better job in reducing both readmission and mortality outcomes than us while not implementing a health policy like the readmission reduction program. So it's not the disease epidemiology, it's more of how we are rendering care and the policies that are incentivizing specific types of care. And part of this increase, part of this decline in risk adjusted readmission that has happened since implementation of the hospital admission reduction program is attributable to the coding severity of heart failure hospitalizations. So Medicare patients that get hospitalized have at least 20 uh, diagnosis codes that are inputted every time we bill for them. And the way the Medicare accounts for disease severity is by adjusting for these other comorbidities. So if someone has more severe disease, their risk adjusted admission rate would be lower than the actual number because you're accounting for differences in disease burden. And what we have seen is that there has been a trend towards upcoding of hospitals, uh, of hospital discharges for heart failure, such that we are trying to overplay the disease severity in an effort to lower the risk adjusted readmission rate number. And that may have contributed to some extent in reducing the risk adjusted readmission rate without actually reducing the raw readmission burden. And th that was elegantly demonstrated by Andrew Ibrahim's group in Michigan as shown in this graph here. So if you don't adjust for the, the disease severity, you see a more flat trend in the readmission burden as, a, uh, as opposed to when you do adjust for all the disease severities. Another important observation that has been made in the, pre, uh, in the post heart failure readmission reduction era is an increase in the observation stays for patients with heart failure that do not count towards index events, but also readmission events. So if a patient comes with decompensated heart failure to the ER and they get treated in the ER and get discharged before 48 hours, that 
episode is not counted as a heart failure hospitalization. So a lot of hospitals have had an increase in the observation stays post presentation to the ER that may have actually took away from the overall readmission rate, but not really from the burden of healthcare uh, that these patients are uh, suffering from. So if you look at these graphs here, you see the patient percent of participants readmitted on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you can see there is a significant increase in the di diagnosis scores for observation state, a 72% increase that far exceeds the decrease in the readmission events, which is only a modest 20%. And if you put the observation stays into the all uh, rehospitalization events, you see an increase, uh, overall increase in the presentation to the, to the ER and uh, seeking care uh, among these patients. Another example of some of the ways the hospitals have tried to game the hospital readmission uh, metric is basically by prompting providers to not admit a patient if they show to the ER within 30 days of the past discharge. This screenshot comes from one of the hospitals in Dallas where uh, one of my trainees was actually moonlighting and he was admitting a patient with hospital with heart failure. And this prompted up during the part of the readmission, uh, during the part of the admission order set that this patient has had an admission within past 30 days, consider ordering a place in observation instead of a uh, full admission. And again, while this may be within the rules, it does highlight how we have uh, hospitals and health systems have tried to game the system to lower the metric without really improving the care of patients who are coming to the hospital with heart failure. So there are many problems in the current paradigm of heart failure uh, care and other uh, disease care with the incentive being very heavily in favor of reducing the admission without necessarily improving uh, their care. Preventing readmission has been given more importance than actually preventing death in patients. And this is particularly relevant because those who die cannot really be readmitted. Hospitalizations have shifted from uh, full admissions to more observation stays. And there's a lot of pressure on hospitals to keep patients out. And there are a lot of money being spent by health systems to reduce the readmission burden, and which is taking away resources from actually incentivizing improving care and outcomes that are meaningful to, to the patients. And that has been a big challenge. And rightly so, there has been a lot of criticism and uh, issues raised against uh, doing the readmission focused health policy that is currently in practice. And this is very well highlighted and the, the problem is very well captured by this good hearts law that, that basically states that when a measure or a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. And that is exactly what happened with readmission reduction program. We are too focused on improving the metric itself without actually using it as a surrogate measure for care quality and outcomes of patients and not focusing on meaningful improvement in patient outcomes and meaningful improvement in care quality. And this, this is basically the key example of how policy was implemented first and evidence has come later highlighting that policy may have done more harm than good. So the hospital admission reduction program policy was instituted without any pragmatic evaluation in a in control fashion that led to a reduction in readmission. The program was deemed successful, but now evidence has come uh, to, uh, uh, to the forefront that this program may have been associated with an increase in mortality and implementation of uh, strategies to avoid hospitalization without really improving care and outcomes that are meaningful to the patient. So how do we incentivize the right quality improvement programs? How do we incentivize actual improvement in, in uh, outcomes that are meaningful to the patient? And that's where I think if you look back at the, uh, the, this model, I think incentivizing outcome is important, but we have to choose the right outcome that is most meaningful to the patients. So this brings us back to the drawing board and to understand what matters most to the patients. There's a lot of knowledge gap in our understanding of what is most meaningful for patients. Patient-oriented outcomes are not part of the traditional process of care measures or the structural metrics that are used to a certain hospital performance. And we need to align what matters to the patient with what matters to the hospital or health system so that everyone is focused on improving the same outcomes that have the biggest return on investment when it comes to improving patient outcomes.
So there are a lot of patient reported outcome instruments and patient reported outcome variables that are captured during the process of care of patients with heart failure, for example. But the challenge has always been, how do you scale patient reported outcomes to the hospital level so that hospitals can be held accountable for improvement or lack of it uh, at, at the hospital level. And there is need for better patient-centered outcomes that are easily scalable and uh, can be implemented at a larger level through the health system and perhaps uh, throughout the country. And one such metric that our group has worked on is home time. So 30 day home time is a, basically a measure of number of days a patient spends at home after discharge from a healthcare encounter. So if a patient with heart failure gets discharged today, the clock starts for their 30 day home time and each day that they spend away from home counts as loss of home time. So perfect home time for a patient post-discharge is 30 days. And if they spend seven days in hospital post-discharge and 16 days at home, uh, it becomes 23 days. If they spend time in skilled nursing facility or if uh, they die, they lose time from their perfect home time. And then you can calculate the 30 day home time that accounts for both time spent in the hospital, time spent at healthcare facilities and time spent not being alive. And that kind of overcomes this constant tussle between readmission and mortality to give you a more comprehensive and meaningful metric of, of uh, quality. And patients post-discharge would want to spend time at home with family. So it is intuitive and it is very aligned with patients uh, uh, being patient-centered and being meaningful to patients post uh, their healthcare encounter. And we have looked at, uh, uh, our group and others have looked at home time among patients post-discharge from heart failure admissions. So this data comes from Steve Green and uh, uh, Bradley Hamill at Duke, where they looked at home time in patients post-discharge in the Get With The Guidelines uh, heart failure registry, the mean home time in 30 days in the Get With The Guidelines heart failure registry was around 21 days. So on an average, a patient spent 21 days post-discharge at home, and there was a lot, significant contribution of SNFs and LTACs towards the loss of home time. And with longer follow-up, the contribution of death became more meaningful in, in the loss of home time. Now, the Steve Green's work was largely focused on looking at home time at the patient level, and we took that concept and tested it at the hospital level to see whether we can use 30-day home time as a measure of hospital performance. So data here, uh, again, come from 100% uh, MedPAR or Medicare uh, beneficiary cohort data, where we developed the 30-day home time metric at the hospital level and looked at its association with more established metrics of hospital performance so on the, X, uh, on the X axis in both these graphs, we have 30 day risk adjusted home time for each hospital. And on the Y axis, we have 30 day risk standardized readmission rate on your left and 30 day risk standardized mortality rate on your right. And you see that home time is strongly correlated with readmission and mortality. It captures both these adverse outcomes just as well when it comes to uh, holding hospitals accountable for adverse outcomes. We also looked at where the home time at the hospital level, uh, at the patient level was lost. And we saw that the largest contributor of loss from perfect home time came from time spent at LTACs and SNFs, which was around six days on an average out of 30 days and followed by readmission and deaths. So this is particularly important because in our practice, when we're seeing patients, we often don't think of the time that patient spends at SNFs and LTACs post discharge. And a lot of the pressure on hospital is to get patients out of their acute care setting. And as long as they are not in the hospital, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't count towards uh, uh, adverse outcome for them. But if you look at it, SNFs and LTACs are just as important part of a patient's journey uh, post heart failure hospitalization. And it is really important to hold SNFs and LTACs accountable for the care they receive there. So if a patient gets hospitalized from a SNF to a hospital, the hospital bears the cost of readmission and the hospital is, held, uh, or is penalized for that readmission event. The SNF and the LTAC don't, get, don't share that accountability, don't share the readmission penalty burden. And the home time metric is more comprehensive where it holds every player involved in the post discharge care accountable for the outcome in the patient. And if you look at 
the graph on your right, we looked at if we compare the home time metric with the readmission metric, how many hospitals get reclassified in their performance. And we saw that up to 15% of hospitals were reclassified from being poor performer to high performer if we use the, uh, the home time metric as compared to the readmission metric. And 15% were down classified from being a uh, high performer to low performer. And these are the hospitals that had more discordant readmission and mortality rates because now we are putting them together. We see that uh, a more even uh, balance in, in, the, uh, in, the read, in the performance ranking after we account for both of them together. And we saw a similar reclassification uh, pattern when we compared the home time metric with the mortality, 30 day mortality metric as shown in these bars on your right. We have looked at this metric, not just for heart failure, but also for MI to see whether this is something that can be scaled across different conditions. And we saw a very similar pattern of results where hospitalization uh, or time spent at SNFs and LTEX were again the largest contributor of perfect a loss in perfect home time. And we saw a significant reclassification in hospital rankings using the home time metric for MI patients, just as we did for heart failure patients in, in this uh, uh, study. We have also looked at these 30-day uh, home time metric for procedural uh, outcomes, starting with TAVR procedures and patients who received TAVR in the Medicare program between 2015 to 2019. And we saw the same pattern of results that a lot of the time post-TAVR is spent in SNFs and LTACs, which contributes to a significant proportion of the loss of home time. And for procedures, instead of starting the home time clock from discharge, we start the home time clock from day after the procedure because a lot of these procedures are, a lot of these admissions are just for the procedure and the procedural complication can extend the length of stay. So we wanted the length of stay to be part of the time lost away from home time. So if you see the pie chart here, 51% of the days lost away from home time were actually related to Tower Hospital stays. And an interesting uh, observation that we made in this study was while home time was strongly correlated with readmission and mortality rates such that hospitals that had higher home time had lower readmission rate and lower mortality rate, we did not see that, that association for TAVR volume, which is a very well accepted metric of uh, performance for uh, TAVR performing hospitals. So if you look at these graphs on your right, annual TAVR volume in the contemporary era is not associated with the rates of 30 day readmission and rates of 30 day mortality, suggesting that once there has been a plateau in the procedural efficacy and procedural efficiency, the relationship between how many towers are done in a hospital with how patients do post tower kind of asymptotes and is no longer a significant association. In contrast, home time, which is a more patient-centered outcome, continues to significantly capture the risk of adverse outcomes like mortality and readmission as shown in the plus on your left. So if you look at home time uh, as a hospital level quality metric, you see that it is something that encap encaptures the overall patient journey from the day of discharge or the day of procedure to the subsequent uh, follow-up period. And it is something that to be improved, you have to improve specific pattern of care and, and things that matter the most to the patient and thus incentivizes local quality improvement initiatives. It does broaden the the accountability and it uh, accounts for more shared responsibility of not just the hospital, but the SNFs and the LTACs that take care of the patient in the post-discharge period. It does include facility stays, which again are a large component of the patient experience post-procedure or post-discharge. And it prioritizes patients to stay at home with their family and pr prioritizes home health, which can lead to a lot of uh, care being delivered at home. And in this era of virtual monitoring and virtual care uh, that COVID has uh, forced us to buy into, I think home time can be a very meaningful metric that incentivizes us to use more of care that can be rendered at home while patients stay with their loved ones and can receive the needed care at home. And home time is a concept that has been looked at by Medicare as a potential performance metric. In this study done by Rishi Wadra and Bobby Yates group, Basically, they looked at home time, which is called, I think it, it's the word used by Medicare is excess days in acute care, which is basically one minus home time. And they looked at total number of days spent in the ED or observation status for 
based on readmission metric versus the EDAC or the excess days in acute care metric. And what they see is that a lot of the, there is a, uh, a lot of variability in readmission versus the excess days of acute care, such that the readmission metric does not completely capture the performance of the hospital if you look at a more broader metric like overall burden of acute care uh, for the patient. So up to 70% of hospitals that are penalized by readmission metric would have re received penalty by the EDAC metric, but up to a third of hospitals that were penalized by the readmission metric would not have received uh, re uh, a penalty if you were looking at the excess days in acute care metric. So there is up to a third of hospitals that are probably being penalized unfairly just by looking at readmission and not accounting for the overall uh, patient journey post-discharge. So coming back to the two hospital cases that I talked about early on, Parkson and Baylor, where one hospital had higher readmission and the other are, and, but a lower mortality rate. If you look at home time, difference between the two hospitals accounting for everything, we see a 13% lower uh, home time at Baylor compared to Parkland. So despite having a higher readmission rate, owing to the lower mortality rate and lower burden of SNPs and LTAC, we see better home time at a hospital, which would otherwise have been penalized as a worse performing hospital, just focusing on the heart failure readmission rates. So the difference in 30-day home time is 26 days at Parkland versus 22 days and uh, Baylor where the readmission rates were lower. And there is an opportunity for us to pause the existing paradigm and reintroduce more meaningful patient-centered outcomes. The CMS announced relief for clinicians, providers, hospitals by stopping the or putting a pause on the hospital readmission reduction program during the COVID-19 period because of the pandemic and its uh, impact on healthcare in general. And this gives us a good reset point for us to reevaluate what is most meaningful for patients and for health systems, and perhaps come up with a more rigorous process where we create evidence first and then have policy follow the evidence. And in this case, we have created evidence demonstrating that home time is a meaningful patient-centered comprehensive metric, which can be now tested in a, a pragmatic way by phased rollout or by cluster randomized trials to see how holding hospitals accountable for maintaining higher home times may impact care and outcomes in the patients, and then perhaps come up with a, a recalibration of the existing policies so as to create a, a environment in our health systems where patient-centered outcomes are at the front and center of the healthcare we provide, but also the policies we uh, implement to improve uh, these outcomes. So in conclusion, to transition from, there is a big need to transition from hospital-centered outcomes, which are focused on reducing the cost of care to patient-centered outcomes, which focus on improving the patient experience. This will involve incentivizing local QI initiatives to improve a patient's experience and reduce their risk of adverse clinical outcomes, and also investigate the big black box of heterogeneity in the post-acute care utilization, which happens at SNFs and LTACs, and figure out how can we best improve what is done in these post-discharge or post-acute care uh, settings to have the best return on investment from patient perspective. I would like to thank my colleagues and mentors that have uh, participated in different studies that we talked about and the funding sources that have helped uh, do a lot of these studies. Thank you and happy to take questions.